Hello, I'm Angus Rocket. I'm a professor of material science and engineering at the University of Illinois, and I'd like to talk to you today about the dawn of a new energy resource, photovoltaics. You may have heard of this as solar cells, and that's really what we're talking about today. The purists will tell you that there's a difference between any type of solar cell and photovoltaics because there are other things that you can do converting sunlight to energy. So you can do solar thermal conversion and so forth. Photovoltaics, what I'm going to talk to you about today, is direct conversion of sunlight to electricity. No moving parts, very easy. Why should we do this? Well, <clears throat> if you look at the discovery of things like oil, over the years and then the production of oil from energy sources, energy resources, you find that production typically follows discovery with about a 25 to 35 year lag, let's say 30 years, give or take a little bit. And if you look at discoveries, you may hear in the news about new discoveries and so forth. If you look at discoveries, yes, there are individual spikes, there are new technologies, but largely discoveries have fallen off in the last 30 years. And so there's concern that fossil fuel resources, petroleum primarily, will become limited in the future. There's, of course, new resources for natural gas. There's a large but finite source of coal. And then there's nuclear power. Many of these are viable technologies and things by which we can continue to make energy. But all of them, except for nuclear power, put carbon in the atmosphere. And there are concerns about that. Of course, people talk about climate change and so forth. So that brings us to renewables. The renewable technologies that are sort of the, the largest ones are hydropower, wind power, biomass, photovoltaics, solar thermal, geothermal, tidal energy and wind and wave energy, ocean thermal gradients, and so forth. In my personal opinion, the big ones in this list are wind, biomass, and photovoltaics. Hydropower is already being exploited heavily. We use about 50% of the theoretical, theoretically exploitable hydro resource in the United States at the moment. It's growing worldwide, but we're still using a, a large fraction of the hydro resource we already have. Many of the others, such as geothermal, are limited geographically. Tidal and wave energy is limited geographically, and so forth. So renewables, there are many types of renewable energy. I think the biggest ones for the future will be wind, biomass, and photovoltaics, with solar thermal also being important. Why renewable energy? Why solar power? Well, we get about 30,000 kilowatts per person arriving at the world. Considering the number of people in the world and the amount of energy arriving, roughly 10 to the 17 watts hit the Earth continuously, 30,000 kilowatts per person. The US is currently consuming about one and a half kilowatts per person. So that's a big difference. There's plenty of energy out there from the sun. So where does that sunlight go? About 30% of that sunlight is reflected from the Earth, and there's a plot here that shows the reflectivity of the Earth. You can see that up around the poles, the Earth reflects sunlight much better, and around the equator, the, the oceans in particular absorb sunlight very well. About 22% of that energy goes to evaporating water, and that's available as hydropower. And so you might say, well, why don't we have more hydropower available? And the answer is, of course, that most of that water falls back to the Earth as rain, lands directly in the ocean, and we can't make use of it. Only a small fraction of the water that lands on the Earth runs down in rivers that are big enough to practically make use of. So hydropower is limited in spite of the fact that a lot of sunlight goes into evaporating water. About half of that 30,000 kilowatts per person goes into heating the ground, goes into sunlight that falls on the Earth and is absorbed rather than being reflected. About 0.56% of that is used for photosynthesis in plants. Not a very large fraction, 
but 840 terawatts of energy. For comparison, the United States currently consumes about three terawatts continuously on average over the course of a year. Most of that for things like transportation, heating, and industrial applications. So there's certainly a lot of biomass energy stored around the world. Then again, most of us want to eat, and much of that hydro, most much of that photosynthesis energy is stored in plants that we then eat or other animals eat. About a quarter of a percent of the incident sunlight is stored in wind energy. If you're curious, you can calculate the kinetic energy in the wind from the mass of the atmosphere moving at about five meters per second, works out through one half mass times velocity squared to about 300 terawatts of energy. Most of that energy is dissipated as surface friction, and so one could imagine increasing conversion of that energy into usable electric power without changing the environment. You're really just moving around where that surface friction is, and we don't really know whether if we increase the friction in one area, we won't simply transfer more sunlight energy into kinetic energy in the wind. So wind power remains attractive. On the other hand, photovoltaics, have the potential to generate enormous amounts of energy by comparison. At least 6,000 terawatts of energy is available in photovoltaics. So it really requires very little land energy to meet our energy needs with photovoltaics. And that's why I'm going to focus on that today. So where do I see renewable energy going in the future? These are the big four energy sources that I personally see in the future. Photovoltaics, is a very high efficiency power source usable for the directly at the end user. You can generate the energy where you need it, and that's attractive. Wind is a very large scale energy source. We know how to make very large wind turbines and generate a lot of energy that way. Nuclear power will be useful for backup for complementary energy source for nighttime energy when the wind isn't blowing and so forth. And I think we'll do a lot with nuclear. And finally, biomass is very useful for mobile transportation, vehicles, uh, and so forth. Uh, so I see biomass as being an important energy resource, especially for air travel, for example. We've talked about renewable energy sources, about the amount of wind, biomass, photovoltaics, much larger than the others. Before you begin thinking about renewable energy, it's useful to understand the electric power grid because most of the technologies that I'm talking about today are transmitted to users, transmitting electric, electric power to users rather than providing stored energy such as in biomass. So to understand the grid and to understand how renewables fit into that, you need to know a little bit about the grid. So let's begin there. The grid is a way of transporting power from generation sources to consumers. And so the large scale generation sources produce low value power. So wind, hydropower, nuclear, coal, all of these are generating power that has to be sold to the grid. And that's sold at a relatively low value. So two to five cents a kilowatt hour typically. The grid then resells that power. So the, the power grid is a middleman. The, the transmission utilities are middlemen that transmit that power from the generator to the consumer. And when they resell that power to us, they sell it at about twice the cost at which it's generated. So maybe that utility will be paying two to two to five cents a kilowatt hour for the power from the supplier and then it's selling it to the end user at five to 10 cents a kilowatt hour, depending on the scale of the customer and how far the power is transmitted and what time of day, what time of the year, what the surrounding demand is. So the power eventually comes to us. We pay at our electric meter for that power. And we might pay, say, 10 cents a kilowatt hour. You should remember with photovoltaics that this is in general a distributed generation source. In most climates, you can actually generate electric power 
with the photovoltaic array at the user's site. Maybe not all of their power, maybe not all of the time, but at least some of their power can be generated on site at the consumer's location, which means that their electric meter doesn't run, which means that they are offsetting retail price. So when you think about the economics of all types of power sources, remember that wind, nuclear, coal, and so forth, all are large scale centrally generated power sources which are transmitted to the user and therefore they have to be sold at wholesale price. In many cases, photovoltaic power can be sold at retail price at the consumer's electric meter. Now that's not true of very large scale applications, for example, a central power station based on photovoltaic, and there the economics is more demanding. So photovoltaics gets roughly a factor of two benefit from the fact that it can be installed at the user's location in terms of power pricing and break-even point. Another advantage of photovoltaics is that in general, the use demand curve follows more or less the sunlight. It lags behind by a few hours. There may be multiple peaks, but in broad terms, people can be trained to use more power during the day when the sun is up because most of us are awake during the day. Most of us are using power during the day. And so even if we don't do this as much as we could today, we can adjust our behavior such that we match our demand to the local generating capacity. And so, for example, increasing our power demand during the day would be relatively easy to match the sunlight available. In fact, you could even imagine that the daily weather forecast would include a forecast for power price. So you might say, the power price today will be low because it's going to be sunny. Tomorrow will be expensive, so you do your laundry today, you use your dryer today, you use your electric appliances today, and reduce your demand tomorrow. That means that photovoltaics can better match demand. That makes its power more valuable. Okay, So we talk about baseline power and then the daily peak power. Photovoltaics matches well with the daily peak value. The other way to think about energy, about the grid and so forth, is to think about the fraction of the year when power is being produced and how much you can pay for it. So the sort of 24-7, all the time power use uh, where you are, have demand that's continuous, what you'd like to have is an is an expensive plant, you can deal at least with an expensive production plant as long as the fuel is cheap. Because as long as you use it many, many, many hours a day, you can amortize that expensive plant over many kilowatt hours of generation. And as long as the fuel is cheap, it doesn't cost you a lot to run that plant all of the time. So this is typical of nuclear power and hydropower. The plant is relatively expensive, the fuel is relatively inexpensive. So those are good resources for operating that sort of 24-7 energy demand. In the intermediate range, we usually think about we need to shut the plant down, we can't pay a lot for the energy, or we don't want to pay a lot for the energy, <clears throat> but we have to be able to shut the plant down. That means we can't amortize the cost of the plant over as many generating hours and so you might say, well, we want a less expensive power plant, but because we don't use it all the time, we can deal with more expensive fuel. And that might be, for example, coal plants. More and more, we're going to gas-fired generators that operate part of the time. And then there's the last category where we're desperate for that little bit more power and we're willing to pay a lot for that, that air conditioning on a sunny summer day, where we're willing to pay a lot, so expensive fuel, we can deal with an expensive plant because we're willing to pay a lot for that last little bit of power, but we don't need many generating facilities that are that scale. We don't, we don't need many plants that fit into that category. Photovoltaics has the advantage that we generate the most electric power with the sun when we have the most electric demand. So for example, summertime power, that one really hot sunny day in the middle of the summer in Chicago when everyone turns on the air conditioner, that's a good time 
to have a lot of generating capacity. So one of the advantages of photovoltaics is, in many cases, their pricing is offsetting the most expensive power of the year, the middle summer power demand, when air conditioning is in highest demand. So especially in hot, sunny climate, demand matches very well with generation. Again, photovoltaics has an advantage for that part of the generating pie. I've worked in photovoltaics for many years now, and the question that I've always been asked is, are we there yet? When are photovoltaics, when are renewables going to become significant? Well, this chart shows you that answer in two different ways. You can see how photovoltaics has been growing rapidly. In fact, in recent years, the growth rate has been more like 50 to even higher. We had a, a year where we had 80% growth in the industry. No one expects that to continue, but the PV industry has been growing rapidly. Wind also grew very rapidly. It has slowed a little bit, and historically, nuclear power grew in the same way. So if we said, well, when could we expect these technologies to be significant? Can we, can we get there? When will we be there? Well, if you extrapolate the current wind power growth rate, at 25% a year growth in installed capacity worldwide, we'd hit three terawatt years per year of generating capacity. In other words, we would generate globally the amount of energy that the US consumes in total in 2026, only 14 years from now. And the industry is continuing to grow. Installations of wind are continuing to grow. It continues to be a rapidly advancing technology. So there's reason to believe that growth can continue at least for many, for, for a number of years to come at that rate. In other words, wind is right at the point of really being one of our major energy generating technologies. Photovoltaics can do the same thing, really. It's growing even more rapidly. It started a little behind. It's catching up to wind now. And if you do the same extrapolation at a modest growth rate, 25% per year, you reach that three terawatt years per year level in 2033. Now it's likely that none of these technologies will be the sole generating technology. In fact, it's pretty much guaranteed. It's quite likely that the growth rate won't continue, but at least you could expect that there will be very significant amounts of energy generation from wind and photovoltaics in the near future. And if we had to, we could scale these technologies up by just continuing doing what we're doing now and meet the world's energy needs in the next 30, 40 years. That's very reasonable. Let me give you a couple of examples of power generation throughout the course of a year, throughout local time. So this is an example of a solar power array on the University of Illinois campus. This is a relatively expensive system. It was an early adopter type of system, 30 kilowatt hour, 30 kilowatt capacity array on the University of Illinois business building. Averages about 100 kilowatt hours per day in the sort of September, October time frame of 2009, for example. Amounts to about $5 a day in offset energy costs, or $55,000 a year. Um, this is going to be a difficult way of actually saving money for the university. It makes a statement. OK, we knew that going in. But this was a very expensive array. You know, This was an array that was installed for something like $10 a watt of rated capacity. So it was a very expensive system compared to what can be done now. And I'll give you an example of much less expensive system. Here's one, a much smaller scale system. This is a four and a half kilowatt hour array. This system was installed for about $20,000. If we can get a 30% rebate on federal taxes, which is the current policy, then the net cost of the system would be in the range of $12,000 for the actual generating capacity. There was some additional costs in this array for monitoring systems that aren't required. The array generates about two, has, has generated about 2,500 kilowatt hours in its first three months of operation. We could expect about eight and a half megawatt hours per year. That represents 
something like $680 per year in electricity at prevailing current prices, that would give about a 17-year payback. On a 25-year pay <clears throat> warranty system, that's a pretty good payback rate. So at least this system is breaking even. We talk about economics, and let's talk about the small-scale developing technology. If we're going to look at the arrays I just mentioned, and you say, well, okay, that was expensive. Should we be doing this? Should we be thinking about the cost of these small-scale arrays that are for early adopters? Well, it's really about what is cool for us. A few years ago, many people were buying large, heavy vehicles. I show here the example of a Cadillac Escalade, a very pretty vehicle, but not something that anyone needs for transportation. They bought it because it's cool. They bought it because that's what the President of the United States might be expected to drive around in. And they want to feel like the President of the United States, perhaps. So. That was cool. They spent about $55,000 on their Cadillac Escalade at that time. What if instead cool had been, let's buy a solar array and a Toyota Prius. The Prius at the same time cost about $22,000 for a basic Prius that provided completely satisfactory transportation. It's not a pickup truck. It doesn't carry huge amounts of material, but that's not why you buy a Cadillac Escalade either. So let's compare with the Prius, $22,000. Take the remaining $33,000 that you would have spent on the Escalade and buy a solar array. And that produces power. So take the money from the power produced, put it back into the value of the array, and in the end you wind up with, say, a 5.5 kilowatt array. That generates about 10,000 kilowatt hours per year for the average sunlight in the United States, which is typical of Illinois. Okay, so you might expect to get quite a lot of power out of that, and it's not about economics, it's about cool. All right, so we need to redefine cool in some of these arguments about cost today. But what if you do want to talk about cost of the technology? What if you do want to save money on what you do? This comes down to technologies that you could invest in and what, we, what should we do research in? So a little history for a moment. Let's just take a pause and look at the, the historical arguments. Here's the curve that shows what's called a learning curve. This is the module price for crystal and silicon solar modules as a function of cumulative production over the lifetime of the technology to 2005. At the time, in 2005, many people were saying, well, there's no other technology that can compete with silicon. There is no way that any other technology can beat silicon because silicon has such a lead in terms of the actual manufactured and deployed technology. And so we might as well give up doing research on these other ideas. Well, if that were the case, we'd all be driving horses and buggies because in the early 1900s, everybody had a horse and buggy. The number of buggies that had been produced was huge and there were no cars to speak of. So cars could not have made a breakthrough. Why did they succeed? The initial cars were not particularly good technology, but they made progress in the end. And so they did win out eventually. So let's look at what happened because this curve was used to argue against all of the other technologies, and it was wrong. So a company called First Solar, which was more or less abandoned in 2005, uh, suddenly came on the scene and said, you know, actually, we can make solar modules. Not very many at the time, but we can make solar modules for just over a dollar a watt. That was less expensive than even this strong, long history learning silicon tech technology at the time, and it surprised everyone. Well, First Solar started scaling up, their learning curve has taken off, and they've caught up mostly with silicon in terms of total produced technology. Their product has come down in price, and silicon has been forced to follow, so the, the marginal cost of silicon has, has changed, and people are selling silicon solar modules much closer to cost. So 
really the lesson that I take away from this is all ideas in science research are worth investigating. They're worth looking into, maybe not worth investing in for large scale, but maybe so. And you have to be persistent. You can't dismiss ideas just because they look like long shots to start with. Science is worth doing. And so while I may mention in this talk that some technologies are less attractive or show less promise, remember the case of silicon. It's always worth investigating new ideas. So this is really the graph that says it all. This is the plot of module price over time. And what you can see is that first solar has revolutionized the industry by bringing their cost of manufacturing down under $1 per watt. That means that selling at even $1.50 per watt gives them a factor of two price relative to their cost. That means that they can make a significant amount of money, and that's driving the scale up at the in, in the industry. At the same time, this has forced the cost of silicon modules down for the consumer, the price of the silicon module down to match the first solar price as much as possible for the cadmium telluride product. And that saved everyone money, and it's also greatly increased the demand for silicon solar cells. So now even silicon solar cells are being sold at a very reasonable price, a little over a dollar per watt, between a dollar ten and a dollar fifty per watt, depending on the scale of the system. And so all of the technologies have come down tremendously in price, and this is fueling the enormous growth. So what is needed? We're making a lot of progress. We're not there yet. If you look at the economics, you might still say, well, you know, the, the technology is not quite competitive. The payoff times are long for your current technology. The system, the four and a half kilowatt hour system, is four and a half kilowatt system that I showed you earlier that was installed for on the range of $18,000, even with a government rebate, would take much of its guaranteed lifetime to pay off but that was still an expensive system. So how can we actually make a system that is competitive as installed? Well, here's an example. This is, these are some examples of First Solar's projects that they're working on at the moment. The Agua Caliente facility is in installation at the moment. Projects such as Topaz, which represent half a gigawatt of installed capacity are being developed at the moment. Federal loan guarantees have been approved for the Topaz project. And First Solar argues, I think, very reasonably, I refer you to their website, that they can install these things and compete in a utility scale. So now we're back to the large scale energy manufacturer environment where you have to compete at a lower price. First Solar feels that in very large scale facilities, they can install less less expensively and for a price that is going to give them competitive energy with the rest of the community that they can sell to the grid and make money in the end. Now we're really talking about growing the technology. So if you can make money on installed modules competing at grid power prices, now you're really going to drive growth of the industry because that means you can compete anywhere, anytime. That has driven First Solar's transformation, and this slide shows the growth of their manufacturing capability. Not only are they growing in manufacturing capability and reducing their price, but the output of their individual manufacturing lines has been continuously increasing. So a plant that started manufacturing 25 megawatts of solar cell per year is now manufacturing over 30, over 63 megawatts. So they're improving the efficiency and performance of their lines at the same time that they're building more manufacturing lines. This is a great opportunity, and it's what's reducing the price of their technology. Let's turn now to a few more details. Let's get a little more technical, because we've spent a lot of time looking at the photovoltaic environment, the economics and systems, and so forth. So let's talk more specifically now about photovoltaic systems. Photovoltaic solar cells are diodes. It's the simplest active electronic device you can imagine. No moving parts. Sunlight falls on the device. It produces 
DC electric power immediately at the device. Very simple, very reliable. These devices can last 25 or more years in the field without problem. There are many old systems that are still running reliably after many, many years. Well, what do we have to think about when we design a system? We have to think about shadows falling on the modules. We have to think about how to isolate those modules that are shadowed from the ones that are generating power, and that can be designed into the system. So we have to think about that. The diode has to be put in a package, so it has, has to be encapsulated, usually under a piece of glass or some sort of flexible polymer material that protects it from the environment. None of these systems can stand to be exposed to the environment over time because water has conductivity and it will allow corrosion to happen. The voltages generated in photovoltaic systems will corrode anything, and so the system must be isolated inside of a well-sealed package. Glass is nearly ideal for this, and it's also very inexpensive, so most systems are based on a glass encapsulation. Of course, the problem with glass is it's very heavy. That makes shipping costs high. So a research opportunity for those of you thinking of doing research in photovoltaic could be simply a low-weight, high-performance encapsulation system that would protect the device from the environment. We then transfer the electric power to the grid. We have to do that by converting it from DC power to AC power, and the conversion is done by an inverter. Typically, the inverter is the least reliable part of a photovoltaic system. And so, if, again, if you're interested in doing research, the inverter is a high uh, demand um, part of the system, something that really needs a lot of research. Storage is, of course, another aspect. If we had a really effective storage system, that would help photovoltaics and wind greatly. So working on storage technologies, again, would be a great benefit to photovoltaics. This is a map of the United States solar power resource. You can see that solar energy is primarily located in Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, and West Texas. And so systems are being installed in those areas primarily, especially Southern California, where demand is close to the supply and where the supply is high. But the example systems that I showed you at the University of Illinois and in, and in the area, the four and a half kilowatt system, are both sort of average generating regions. And so central Illinois is typical of the United States. Many areas, if you can do economic viability in Illinois, you can probably do it pretty much anywhere. Maybe not in the Pacific Northwest, maybe not in the far Northeast, but most of the United States generates at least as much as Illinois would generate. And so it's a good area for example cases especially in the southwest where many of the systems are being installed, especially the large ones, generating capacity is very high, reliability is very high, and demand is also typically very high. So they work very well. That's why they're being installed in those regions. Some of the things you have to think about when you think about research or development of technology in photovoltaics, it's a unique technology. The cost drivers require the lowest cost, highest throughput processes possible. And I give a couple of examples on this slide of a couple of ways in which solar cells are manufactured. For example, first solar, this very low cost technology, has a very high rate evaporation based deposition tool. There's a company called NanoSolar, which is working on ink based printing. Essentially, they're going to make solar cells on a printing press. And they've demonstrated some significant successes in that area. So these are things that you could do with photovoltaics that really allow you to drive costs down. And the successful manufacturers are doing these things today. Technologies that are used a lot in microelectronic manufacture, such as lithography and dry etching, are generally considered to be impractical, especially for bulk power applications. You can do space-based applications, you can do military applications, and you can do select terrestrial applications where you can do a very high efficiency photovoltaic device with some sort of lithography technology, but it's much more difficult. So if you're going to do photovoltaics, 
and you're going to plan on using lithography, you have to realize you need a lithography technology that works in very large areas for very low costs at very high rates. That's not out of the question, but you need to keep it in mind. In general, successful technologies in photovoltaics pretty much universally are very low tech, very high rate, high throughput, and produce high performance devices. High performance, we need to think about this. How do we balance efficiency and cost? The majority of the costs in a complete photovoltaic system scale with area, not with power. So if we were to double the power output from our photovoltaic, we would roughly cut the cost of the system in half. So if you think about a photovoltaic system, it might have glass in it, it might have lenses, it might have racks that hold the system and so forth. All of those things scale with area. They don't change in cost if the photovoltaic array produces twice as much power. Well, as we saw in the earlier slide, silicon is more expensive than cadmium telluride. So you might ask, why is anyone still manufacturing silicon technology? The answer is that silicon has maintained a lead over cadmium telluride, for example, in total efficiency, which means that all these other costs that are significant drivers in the total system cost are somewhat lower for silicon. And that's really what's maintaining the competitiveness of silicon over time. So all of these technologies have the potential to scale up, but efficiency is really important. That's why we talk so much about it in the community. That's why if you get into the field, you'll hear people talk a lot about efficiency of the final technology. Doubling the efficiency halves the cost of the system. In addition, heat is an issue with photovoltaics. And so if we increase the efficiency, the device does not get as hot. If it stays cool, the system is more efficient, works better. So all around, we have a very strong drive for going with more efficient solar cells. That doesn't mean that we can always have more efficiency, but it matters. And so we are people are looking at extreme high efficiency devices, which may be very complex to manufacture. For example, the one that I show here, this is a National Renewable Energy Laboratory device, a so-called inverted metamorphic solar cell, multiple junctions, very high technology, complex and difficult to manufacture, but very efficient. So efficient, in fact, that it may be the competitive technology operating small area solar cells under lenses. And there's an example at the top of this slide of an Aminix concentrator. If you notice the scale of the car next to it, that's a huge focusing concentrating array. All of those little panels are multiple Fresnel lenses. They focus about 500 times the sunlight onto a solar cell. They track the sun across the sky. And that means that they're generating the maximum amount of energy from sunlight all the time. Anytime the sun is up, the array is always pointed at it and generating the maximum energy. That may be practical for a high efficiency device. It may be practical for a central power system. It's not as attractive for people who are homeowners, for example, and don't want a large moving object standing around in their yard or on their roof. So it depends what your application is, what sort of a customer you are, what type of system. But in general, efficiency is very important. So we think about the record performance of modules over time. And you'll notice from this slide that many technologies have been making sort of continuous advances over time. There are some very exciting prospects. The very high efficiency devices are now in four to five junctions in the solar cell. Organic devices are improving greatly. There are many other technologies that aren't shown in detail on this slide. But basically, multi-junctions and thin films hold a lot of promise. And in particular, I'll note that the high efficiency concentrators and amorphous silicon technologies have both benefited primarily from going to multi-junctions over time. Technologies such as copper indium diselenide, so-called SIGS technology, and the cadmium telluride technology that First Solar uses are both single junction technologies. So they could potentially be improved, scaled up, and their efficiencies improved to yield very high performance devices. 
Okay, so what is needed? In my opinion, current technology opportunities, what do we need? We need efficiency gains. As I said, the system price drops as the efficiency goes up. Our best way of making cost improvement in the final system is in efficiency improvement in the existing low-cost technologies. Increased throughput for manufacture, things like thin silicon, advanced contact arrays, better silicon manufacturing technologies that are faster, waste less material, and so forth. Increased material usage. All of the materials used in these devices are rare and expensive. Silicon is not rare, but it's expensive, and so we need to cut down the material use in the devices as they're manufactured. Recycling and remanufacturing methods need to be developed. For example, there's no reason why a silicon solar cell should fail even for geologic time periods. So how can we reuse it? How can we say, well, your silicon solar module is failing, but the silicon diodes are still okay. So let's take those silicon diodes back out of the module, remanufacture them into new solar modules without having to make that expensive silicon solar cell again. If we can do that again, we can reduce cost of our technology recycle, reuse, and not have to spend money on expensive parts of the process in the future. And finally, we need to do system model modeling and understand what the key areas, what are the critical paths for reducing the cost of the technology. Let's look at a few of the current technologies for a few minutes. Silicon is an excellent performing material. Most of the modules, the, the highest performance modules you can buy in complete systems, are 20% efficient. That's an enormously efficient technology, really, when you think about it. And the price of the technology is coming down. There are real benefits we can expect in silicon in the near future. So anyone who tells you that silicon is an old and dead technology hasn't really thought about it. There are very few, in fact, there may be no technologies in which silicon was a legitimate competitor in which it's ever lost. So the message I take away is, Never bet against silicon. It always has the potential to be a winner. And there are good reasons to expect that. They're very high efficiency devices. They're expensive. They're hard to produce in large areas. On the other hand, as we've seen, high efficiency really is a huge benefit. So perhaps we'll see high efficiency devices coming down in cost as they're manufactured in larger scales. And they may be the winner in the end. So let's make high efficiency less expensive. Thin films are responsible for this cost per watt reduction. That's the breakthrough that we've had in recent years. And so thin films certainly are the current low cost leader. They're the ones that could potentially be the best. So we need to look at thin films as a source of low cost technologies. The question is, can we scale them up? Can we develop the technology? Can we make these technologies what they should be in the end? Organic photovoltaics. Intrinsic problems make it difficult as a competitor, but it's easy to develop the technology. It's exciting. It's made enormous progress. And it seems very likely at the moment that organics will continue to be important competitors, competitors that need to be researched technologies that need to be developed. There are many aspects of organic photovoltaics that make them very exciting. So remember the first solar example, and we won't dismiss organic photovoltaics. Other novel concepts are much trickier to implement. They're likely to be very expensive. And in my personal opinion, you need to look at them carefully. But again, we'll remember the first solar example, and we won't write them off. They need to do research, but at this point, most of the novel concepts and probably even organics really are primarily a research operation transitioning in the case of organics to manufacturing. But there's a long way to go. If we think about types of existing solar cell technologies, crystalline silicon is common. It makes very efficient devices. Amorphous silicon, another competing technology over the long time scale, is available as a flexible technology. It's lower in efficiency, which makes it expensive by comparison. But again, it's an interesting technology. Cadmium cyride, inexpensive, 
It's hard to buy for various political reasons. And one of the concerns with cadmium telluride is the availability of tellurium in the long term. Tellurium is a rare element in the Earth's crust. And so it's not clear how much tellurium is available and whether that will limit the technology. There are various other technologies. They're not available yet. Don't hold your breath, but they may become available in the future, including my favorite, which is copper indium diselenide. You may hear people talk about third generation photovoltaics. And while this is exciting, while this is interesting and something worth developing, it's worth taking a moment to look at the existing technologies and how they fit into that third generation concept. So the original third generation, first generation, second generation, third generation concept was illustrated in this chart where the claim was that the first generation technology silicon in this number one area in green was never going to be competitive because it was always going to be too low in efficiency and too expensive in cost per unit area or cost per watt of generating capacity. So they said, all right, well, the second generation technologies, what about those? Those are things like thin film polycrystalline devices. Well, maybe they could do a little better, so they won't be terribly efficient, but they'll be less expensive. And finally, you'll hear about the third generation technologies, which are supposed to be based on nanoparticles and things like that. They're supposed to be much more efficient, perhaps expensive, but much more efficient. Take a moment to think about any technology that you're introduced to and think about how it fares with respect to existing technologies. And don't dismiss the existing technologies just because somebody comes along and says they have a new idea. So just like we don't want to dismiss the new ideas, case in point, cadmium telluride for solar, we also don't want to exist to dismiss existing technologies, and I'll give you two examples. Crystalline silicon started out in the first generation regime. It's come down in price. In fact, it's getting close to a dollar per watt or $100 per square meter, and the efficiency of the record modules is up around 20%. We can reasonably project that the manufacturing cost of silicon solar cells will drop into the 80 cent per watt range. And we already know we can make modules in excess of 20% efficiency. Those are available today. If we can bring these two technologies together, you can see where the silicon crystalline silicon technology will go right into the middle of the third generation regime. Cadmium telluride can do even better. It's currently in the 75 cent per watt range. It's in fact better off than what this chart shows because this chart plots it at 9%, 10% efficiency at 80 cents per watt. In fact, it's now down to 75 cents a watt and 12% efficiency, so it's moved up on the line. If you take it to the current record efficiency solar cell and the projected cost of the technology, it puts it right in the middle of the third generation cost regime. Copper indium diselenide is not manufactured in a large scale today, but it is even more efficient than cadmium telluride currently and should be manufacturable for the same price per watt. So we can imagine that copper indium diselenide will be, again, right in the middle of that third generation regime. So we won't dismiss the new technologies because of the first solar example historically. We won't dismiss the current technologies because, in fact, they show good potential to compete with any concept that is currently being discussed. A couple of breakthrough combinations that you may want to be aware of. The Sanyo HIT contact technology is illustrated here. This allows, allowed Sanyo to take silicon solar cells that were nominally in the sort of 16% efficient range, some of them even less efficient, and take them to 20% efficient, to take modules to 18 to 20% efficiency using this novel contact technology. This technology, in my opinion, will overwhelm all other contact technologies for silicon. It does not involve any photolithography, but achieves efficiencies that are similar to the best efficiencies that can be achieved with expensive photolithography techniques. And so it really holds the promise to take existing silicon solar cells 
into the 20 to 24 percent efficient module range. It really has the potential for a breakthrough in silicon. Cadmium telluride, we've already looked at very briefly. Very high throughput processing. First Solar talks about its current technology taking a piece of bare glass through to a finished solar cell in approximately one hour, two hours, roughly two hours by the time that the complete process is done and the modules in a box. So this is very high rate processing. That means you can amortize the cost of the plant across many modules and greatly reduce your capital expense contribution to the device. Of course, doing things at such high rates, the devil is in the details, but in the case of cadmium telluride technology, there are things that really benefit you and allow you to make the sort of progress, the sort of high rate processing that First Solar has achieved. I've already also mentioned nanosolar. There are many aspects of the nanosolar technology that are very exciting. First of all, they're using this printing technology using nanoparticle inks that allow them to produce their absorbing material at very, very high rates for extremely low cost. They have an exceptionally thin back contact layer. They're doing their technology on aluminum foil, which is a low cost, flexible substrate. They have many other breakthrough concepts in their technology, including the top contact. And all of these things put together make nanosolar's printed technology, if it can be brought to a manufacturing solution at a low cost, that could potentially have real advantages over any other technology you can think of. So silicon might win because of the Sanyo HIT contact technology applied across other types of silicon solar cells. Cadmium telluride already shown to be a very low cost, high rate manufacturing process, very inexpensive. Nanosolar, copper and diselenide solar cells can potentially be a very attractive technology. A lot of problems yet to solve, a lot of research yet to do, but very exciting and potentially moving this technology forward to very high efficiencies, very low manufacturing costs. And of course, the organics and other solar cell technologies will be following along in the footsteps of these ones that I mentioned here with the potential to further decrease costs and really have some exciting results. <clears throat> it's worth taking another moment to look at the availability of material because <clears throat> the biggest questions you'll hear about cadmium telluride and copper and diselenide are the global availability of indium and tellurium resources. Things that can affect this, production is expanding rapidly. There's, even though there's a small fraction of tellurium in the Earth's crust, that still represents a lot of tons of tellurium somewhere in the Earth. And so the question is, can we get it out? Can we find more indium? Production is expanding rapidly in these materials already. Higher efficiency will reduce the need for these materials, but prices for these materials can rise by at least a factor of five before they come, become a major cost driver. So there are good reasons to believe that at least for the short term, production can expand rapidly for both cadmium telluride and copper and diselenide without hitting these resource limits. Ultimately, this is probably going to mean that we'll also be manufacturing silicon solar cells and other solar cells that neither of these technologies will come to completely dominate the world photovoltaic production. A cross-cutting technology that would be of help to all photovoltaics would be microinverters. Converting DC to AC in the modules would make the module plug and play, would allow you to go down to your local store, buy a photovoltaic module, put it on your roof, and plug it into your household electric system without a lot of the complex and expensive installation requirements that we have today. So a very reliable, robust, and small-scale inverter that could be integrated into the solar module would be a very important enabling technology for solar cells. I encourage you to look at that as a research technique as well, something that you could work on. So where do I think see things going in the future? If we think about our energy needs long term, we need to be able to store the energy. And the most efficient way of storing energy that we've ever found 
is liquid hydrocarbon fuel. We know that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a problem. Why not develop a technology to remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, reduce it back to octane, and continue using octane as a fuel source like we do now in gasoline? But let's do that by recollecting the carbon dioxide, a technology that doesn't currently exist and needs research. Plants do it. Let's try and do it more efficiently and on a larger scale and without requiring the sort of growth environment that plants require. But let's gather that carbon dioxide back up. We know how, in principle, to reduce that back to octane. We need to develop those steps, make them more efficient, and that way we'll be able to store these renewable energy, source, energy sources over time, take that photovoltaic energy, take that wind energy, and put it to good use even when we don't need all of it. And then we'll be able to have fuel for our cars. So in conclusion, the future of energy combines, in my opinion, photovoltaics with wind, biomass, and nuclear power. It will require large-scale storage technologies, such as the hydrocarbon production concept that I mentioned in the previous slide. In my opinion, photovoltaics will grow to be com competitive with conventional power in the near future, if it isn't already. And it certainly is looking like it's very close. Photovoltaics are a peak power technology matching the daily and annual peak demand, which means that they can compete with in a more expensive power market, and that further encourages the economics of photovoltaics today. We really need storage technologies for full implementation. So thank you very much for listening to me, and I hope that you'll do research in, buy the technology, look at it, invest in it, photovoltaics is the energy of the future.